you're listening to the Book Talk Today podcast, a podcast that inspires readers to obtain valuable insights to inform, educate, and improve lives. My name is Orn Abdi. I'm an avid reader, best known for the creation of the One Minute Book Review community, and I'm sitting down with authors to delve deeper into the books they have written to uncover the story behind the story. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 31 of the Book Talk Today podcast. Today we are joined by Lua Al-Romani. Lua is the head of, was the head of finance and planning at Bank Bemo Saudi Franci, the largest privately owned bank in Syria when the conflict broke out in 2011. He has over 14 years of experience in various finance and strategic planning roles across the Middle East and the UK. And today we'll be discussing his book, Lessons from a War Zone, How to Be a Resilient Leader in Times of Crisis. Louis, it's a pleasure to have you on. Uh, thank you, On uh, A pleasure to be here with you. So when I read the book, I felt like it was part history, part politics, part memoir, and mostly a leadership manual. And I felt like this book was fascinating, as we previously discussed a minute ago, um, having visited Syria and that area in the early 2000s and me thoroughly enjoying going there and experiencing the culture and everything and going with my grandparents felt great as well and seeing how the news is very marred um only showing the the bad sides of of what's going on there but as you've beautifully described in your book it's very much a an ode to to your to your to your home country which was uh, beautiful to hear so I have many questions that I wanted to to ask you and discuss about the book in particular, but I think a great place to start would be your reasons behind writing the book. Sure. So, so if I go back in time around ten years ago, uh, just when the war started, like you know, this was uh, something completely new to us. Uh, the vibe back then was very positive uh, actually and the uh, the whole country was uh, poised for for almost a dubai like uh, renaissance and the last thing that we we, we had you know imagined that was that you know such a the crisis would uh, unfold and i remember uh sitting with our french ceo you know just just in the first few weeks when he was uh, asking us whether i mean we thought that such a thing would uh, unfold in uh, syria just like we saw it on uh folding elsewhere in the Arab world and we said no and we were very emphatic you know about it but then uh, as uh, the whole world knows yes I mean it did evolve and things did get worse and uh, and we found ourselves working in an in, uh, environment that was just uh, becoming more and more challenging and I remember in the first few months uh, I was like all over the place you know, and uh, scrambling and looking for uh, guidance and looking for really books or just, you know, sources of, of guidance uh, on how to lead during a crisis. And the, the literature that uh, I found was, you know, mostly related to, to a financial uh, crisis, a PR uh, mm-hmm. crisis, nothing near the scale of uh, crisis that we were uh, mm-hmm. witnessing. So, so a few years uh, later, I found myself in a, myself in a position to uh, to actually write that book. The you know the book uh, that I was initially uh, looking for and just you know be really uh, yearning for that type of knowledge. Uh, after so many years of uh, working in what most people uh, agree was probably the worst place in the world to do business, and I found myself you know able to write such a book. So so that's one reason. Second reason would be on I mean Syria. Uh, is a b- beautiful country that's been sadly defined by uh, the war and i felt that yes i mean there are a thousand voices of of agony and of uh, legitimate despair and agony and pain but why not why not there be like uh, at least one uh, positive uh, voice with with the uh, with like you know every thousand the voices of, of agony because i did think that you know uh, there uh, was a genuine learning ex- uh, experience that i thought could could be shared with the with the, with the world to to just uh, aid people uh, around the world when 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 facing a crisis. Yes, I mean there there are t- different types of uh, crises in the world, but I do think that the principles of like facing one, regardless of the actual uh, context or the trigger, might be universal to 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 a large definitely. Extent. And I think that 
your experience is definitely in the management space and you studied this a lot and you probably know the frameworks very well. You put some frameworks in the book. But I think a lot of people relate to the actual stories and the personal experience of someone going through it and how they can relate it to their own situation. Because everyone won't be experiencing what you've been experiencing in Syria yeah. with mortar yeah. bombs and, and, and everything like that. But they can take those lessons and principles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, when I, when I first wrote the book, like um, uh, placing it uh, in a genre was a little uh, difficult because I mean, business books tended to be very technical, very. I uh, wouldn't want to say dry, but uh, but they don't really focus uh, on the personal yeah. aspect of the author because I mean, no one cares about the author. You know, I mean, they care about you know what uh, what what they're uh, saying if it's a business book. But mine was a blended memoir business book and man, i thought i mean uh, hope uh, the readers might find some of these stories interesting. yeah definitely so, i think yeah. it just like you said it gives a voice to the side that isn't being expressed which i think for a lot of people who don't yeah. know what it's like on the ground i think it's nice to, to see mm. that different that different perspective so some of the things i wanted to talk about the book is very much centered upon leadership and one of the things i wanted to talk about was as the before actually before we get into asking about leadership in particular i think it'd be good to clarify what your day-to-day -day role was um with the with sure. the bank and just talk about what you used to do on a day-to-day -day basis during that time sure so so i was uh, heading the finance uh, and the planning uh functions and later on i became the C cfo so, so i was uh, basically in charge of uh, finance of uh, strategic planning uh, and I was a part of the executive management uh, committee of the bank which uh, which really took the the uh, executive the decisions uh, across the board so so in a nutshell this is it so when you were doing that and in in the book you talk about the difference between leading during that time and obviously knowing about the operations on the on on the ground and something I want to talk about is how do you possess a broad view of the business, but also having sort of your feet on the ground and not becoming too detached? Is it about becoming an effective delegator or do you have to sometimes just get your hands dirty with some of that work as well? <laughs> well, I uh, think, I mean, with time and uh, with a lot of errors uh, along the way, I mean, we learned uh, that it uh, that it's really more, more of an art than, than a science because I mean, there are, uh, there are opposing forces. Like, like on one end, you do you do need to be very strategic, and really not you know allow the daily challenges uh, to like you know, steer you away from the from from the vision and from like you know meet, meeting your strategic objectives. But I mean, then again, the the dilemma is is that when when you when when you become maybe too strategic, you might get disconnected from the ground and you know remain uh, somewhat aloof and not able to 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 meet the challenges and on the other hand you know because you know this is a crisis and you have daily challenges daily novel challenges emerging it does become very tempting to get you know sucked into the daily challenges and not able really to see the the uh, to really have this strategic dimension so 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 it's really about being very mindful and laser focused on the importance really of being very strategic, but at the same time, very close to the ground. Uh, and our uh, mantra really was to, to be very un, uh, swerving on the vision, but very flexible in the mm -hmm. uh, tactics. So, so, so just like um, we said, yes, a lot of delegation and a lot of uh, operational flexibilities. So, so, so uh, um, ensuring that we had lots of uh, buffers, lots of alternatives, lots of choices, uh, lots of ways to to reconfigure you know uh, operations in uh, 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 such a way that the, that we could uh, operate as smooth uh, as we could you no know, uh, matter what uh, mm -hmm. happened so so like a little uh, the story on uh, we uh, in the first year of the uh, conflict we needed to place our backup for server somewhere like uh, we were largest bank in the country and we were not allowed to uh, place our backup uh, server outside the country and you know this was the largest bank we had live data of you know people's yeah. banking transactions uh, uh, happening live and uh, in the uh, first year Aleppo was the safest uh, city in the country so so it made the per perfect sense to place it there but then you know almost uh, out of nowhere Aleppo sadly uh, became the uh, epicenter of the 
of the war and you know even the word Aleppo is somehow synonymous now with with you know scenes of of utter mm -hmm. devastation so so i mean we learned the the hard way that i mean you can uh, you can plan and you can you know do do your own risk and management but uh, at the end of the day unforeseen things will happen so so uh, the uh, key is to 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 allow yourself to have lots of options and really embed that you know operational flexibility do you feel like at that time as well it's very much based on intuition as well like how you feel about something rather than pure rationality because you can look at the numbers you can look at your frameworks yeah. but at the end of the day it's just about how that feels like in the book you give examples about how yeah. perhaps cost cutting might hit your bottom line and you talk about the tea and coffee but then culturally not yeah. offering tea and coffee could be well worth you know, more of a hit than twenty five, twenty four thousand dollars a year, like you say in the book. So, is it more just about the yeah. intuition that you have and making the best decision at that time, rather than just over planning or just focusing too much on your critical success factors? Uh, well, I think you know it's a both because it's a mix of both. Because when you when you say in uh, intuition, that uh, I mean to me that mostly uh, resembles a, a, like your first. Uh, mm. inclination and the first you know inclination during a, a crisis does I mean sometimes yes like you know it helps but but not uh, all the time because what uh, happens during a, a crisis like you, you're you're initially you know inclined to to be very conservative very defensive very aggressive very reactive which is very understandable and I was like that you know initially but then with time and with a lot of uh, errors uh, like uh, uh, on the way we learned that yes I mean you do need to to listen to your in uh, to uh, tuition uh, but at the same time be very mindful of of uh, the rest of uh, the dynamics like uh, like I mean surrounding your decision so so uh, you just like talked about cost uh, uh, cutting and so on you know and uh, I think most managers like you know in the world you know, at the slightest hint of, of a crisis, the first thing that comes to mind is like, you know, cutting costs. And I will tell you why, because cutting costs is the easiest mm -hmm. thing to do in a crisis. Uh, it is a thousand times may, maybe easier to cut 20% of your costs than, you know, increasing 10% of your of your income during a, a crisis. So, so maybe ones in uh, tuition would lead them to this, uh, direction, but but uh, I mean, for us, we just we were we made sure that the we went through a process that really scrutinizes these the uh, decisions, so so that we don't uh, end up you know taking the easy route that might save us in the short term, but you know end up Definitely. hurting us. In Something the long you run. touched upon as well, just there briefly, was your mistakes that you've made, and obviously I don't want to go into like a job interview to talk about your experiences or mistakes or anything, but <laughs> I think it'd be good because I think people have this yeah. idea that leaders are people who don't make mistakes. I know that might be a fallacy, and it definitely is a fallacy because everyone makes mistakes, but I think it'd be great for you to touch upon your process during that time and maybe your process in general of dealing with the mistakes that you've made and how you've gone and learned from them and then implemented changes going forward. Sure, sure. Uh, I think uh, starting from, you know, a place that, you know, this working in a crisis is a, a novel challenge for, for uh, everyone. And and that there is a learning curve and that collectively, like, you know, across the organization, there is an understanding that, you know, I mean, this is something totally new. We are trying out you know, new ways of, you know, doing the things. The intention is always uh, genuine, but that, you know, mistakes will happen because it is uh, something very new. And, you know, I mean, when you make decisions, you're you're uh, basing them on uh, assumptions based, based on what you know things work, but during a crisis, things like change on the ground, and and it's just, uh, you know, it's just you know a matter of fact that uh, mistakes will happen. So having this this uh, this environment that you know I mean that uh, that has uh, empathy towards this uh, aspect of, and that you know understands that you know I mean mistakes uh, will happen and that it's you know always you know better to like you know stop uh, digging rather than you know digging when 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 you find mm -hmm. yourself you know in a hole. The, mm. that's really imperative and just you know one one uh, story of you know a mistake uh, that i did so so we were doing you know analysis on and uh, studies on you know ways uh, 
you know, of all of our banking transactions. And 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 uh, I made this uh, study, me and uh, my team, on you know the time the time it took to to account certain banknotes. So so let's say a deposit of a million Syrian pounds. How much time did it take, and so on? Then then I realized, like you know, at the end that that I ba made these uh, studies uh, based on assumptions that I thought held true, and which did hold true before the crisis. So so typically, you know, I'm I'm in charge of uh, operations before the war. Uh, a, a the uh, deposit of one million uh, Syrian pounds would be composed of the largest banknote, one thousand Syrian pounds. But then during the, uh, the you know a certain period in the crisis, the largest banknote you know available in the market was mostly two hundred pounds, which which meant that five times the uh, the, the amount of money needed to be counted. But uh, but I didn't know that. Whereas the most junior person in the bank. You know knew that so 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 i mean like that was one turning point for me where where, where just like taught me to 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 be you know again that uh, uh point which i mentioned in earlier to be very close to uh the ground because i mean changes would be happening that you know if you're too aloof you 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 would not be maybe aware of mm. one of the stories that you mentioned in the book which got me got me annoyed and shocked at the same time was the experience that you had when you were sitting in your office and you were reflecting and then you got the call from your mother to say that the the Saudi bank that had 29 percent shares in your in the company had decided to extract only weeks prior they were saying to you about how they wanted to create more systems and become more resilient and stuff like that can you just talk about that experience and how you felt during that and perhaps how you change perhaps your perspective on what people say and what people do because you dedicate i think it's a chapter in the book to say um do more talk less um which is which is a a, a mantra that my granddad uh, lives by and he's always taught us is just do whatever you're going to do don't talk about it kind uh, of thing uh, uh, uh you know on it's really interesting because because uh, that like i mean the phrase that uh, action speaks louder than than words or do more speak uh, less you know it's always universal uh, across all uh, cultures and uh, languages there's uh, almost this universal uh, proverb where where actions uh, triumphs over words and i think it's like very culturally universal so uh, back to that uh, story so so we we were a bank uh, founded by two main banks a lebanese uh, bank and a saudi arabian bank and uh, our biggest co-founder was a Saudi Arabian bank. And uh, what happened uh, is that one day I was uh, working late in, in, in the office and my mom called me and she said, what happened? Like, I mean, the, the, the Saudi Arabian bank uh, abandoned your bank. I was like, what? I mean, I'm in the bank. I'm with the CEO. Mm -hmm. And I was like talking to them, you know, a few days ago, we were in a crisis management committee. And I turned on the news. I just like you know opened a uh, website, and it was there. They they uh, did not let us know. It was a weekday. Twelve hours later, you know there there would be people outside our bank uh, branches, panicking and wanting to 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 withdraw their money. So so that was really a big moment for, for me, and I felt really a, a mix of uh, feelings. You know, feeling of you know I mean abandonment and demotivation and just. You know, just you know, thinking of the uh, uh, colossal challenges that you know we we had you know other you know ahead of us to 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 reassure our clients and more uh, more importantly uh, our staff. Mm. But uh, uh, you know, and even my uh, self, like you know, I mean, I was not you know immune uh, to to these you know feelings of fear. But you know, at the end of the we had learned uh, earlier in the the the, the uh, crisis that. What 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 really matters are the uh, actions that you take more so than, than than any messaging or words that you do. So so we we knew that the, the most important thing we had to do is to to re re uh, reassure everyone by by taking uh, the actions to 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 really accommodate their fears. So so people panicked. They 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 flocked to our ba banks. They wanted to withdraw their money. We made sure that we stacked banknotes, maybe in an exaggerated way. The last thing we would uh, do is uh, try to outsmart them or or to delay withdrawals or to uh, uh, tell them to like you know come back in about two weeks to to withdraw their money. They would have hated us. Yeah, uh, maybe in normal times people might uh, politely uh, decline, resist you if you 
if you try to outsmart them. But during a crisis, we learned that they will come to hate you. Uh, and really, mm. just doing what we were meant to do. We we were we were a bank, and we needed to be there for our customers and to give them money when they wanted to. And what uh, happened later on uh, on is that you know a few weeks later when when you know people saw that I mean we were operating as you know effectively and normally as uh, possible. People didn't really care care about our name because our name was Bank Bemo Saudi Financi, and three words of these four words were 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 identical to the name of the Saudi Arabian bank that left. But people didn't really care, so so it was a thousand times better to have an irrelevant name, but have cash for your clients than 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 have a very relevant name, but not have cash for your mm. uh, uh, clients. Yeah, I like that sentence you put at the bottom of the page um, in in the book where you said you said those exact words. Having an illiquid bank with a great name, no one wants that. They want their money. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. And you know, I mean, people uh, uh, become very laser, you know, focused uh, about their needs during during uh, like uh, a crisis. So so we could have done you know a thousand uh, messaging and press releases, but I mean, we knew you know at the end of the day that the public uh, sentiment would be shaped mainly by the actions that we take. One thing I wanted to talk about was misinformation during that time, because during a time of crisis, especially during the time of, of war during, in Syria during that time, it must have been very difficult to manage the information that the public was getting about, not only your bank, but just generally the war and keeping up morale and everything. How did you, from the executive level, try and manage perhaps misinformation or just information in general? Because what would, would, what would be unique about the war then would be social media, because maybe in previous times there wasn't the access to information that people would have. So how did, yeah. from an executive level, how did you manage that misinformation perhaps or just information in general? Because in the book you talk about noise and filtering out noise. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, so it is a very uh, tough one because uh, I think you know, 30 years ago, you know, you would have uh, information and you would have noise, but not uh, everyone had like you know access to uh, broadcast these. But, but you know, in these uh, times, almost uh, everyone has the, the 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 ability to broadcast information and noise, and there's no way of uh, topping it. I don't really have a like like you know a clear cut, uh, conclusive uh, the answer on. But what I can say is that the more laser focused you are uh, about your vision and the fundamentals that uh, that you're working on, you know the the and the more aligned that your actions are. You know, I mean, towards your, uh, alongside your uh, vision, the better the chances of of instilling genuine trust across all of your stakeholders. Because during uh, the a crisis, all stakeholders become a lot more uh, difficult uh, on, and um, and uh, rightly so. And everyone has their increasing concerns. And yes, I mean, the, I mean, just like that uh, story of the Saudi Arabian bank, there were rumors. You know, circulating mm-hmm. that we were gonna close down in uh, one week. That you know we had no uh, cash left. There were outlandish uh, rumors about Saudi Arabia sending a plane and you know uh, taking all the banks' money back to Saudi you know Arabia. There's no way you could really confront you know all of these individual rumors or mm-hmm. like like you know stories, except by really doing what you meant to do. So so the moment where you know for uh, for two three weeks. You know, we were just like you know out there and and you know giving people what they, uh, they want. I'm not trying to to uh, outsmart them. That was maybe the best response. Mm. You know, when when the people saw that that we were, you know, good at doing what what we were meant to do, that was maybe the best thing uh, to do. And um, initially, uh, on I mean, uh, even uh, before this uh, happened, there was a bank run on, you know, across the country where where people flock to to uh, to withdraw their money. And what some banks did is to you know, I mean, make their uh, operations easier. They 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 took the easy route of not allowing people to uh, withdraw all their, their money, putting withdrawal limits and so on. Mm. I mean, these uh, measures that many banks do when uh, when they're in a, a crisis. Yes, that might have you know helped them in the short run uh, operationally, but uh, but in the long term, it really diminishes trust. Mm. 
and uh, and the people you know ended up withdrawing most of uh, a lot of the, their money there and placing them with with uh, with our bank so so really building genuine uh, trust that's the best response to 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 uh, like you know combat all kinds of misinformation and noise it seems like the central theme of the the book really is being very clear on that vision in the book you talk about and in the beginning of this conversation you said be clear on your vision and then let the tactics change and adapt to the situation it seems like that is the key theme really yeah i mean because people think that you know i mean there's a concept of change and you do need to change and during a, a crisis you do need to to evolve but then but but then some people might be uh, inclined to to end up changing their vision and just you know mixing uh, things up for us it was really i mean we had a very simple uh, vision we wanted to be the number one bank for all syrians whether uh, there was a war whether there, there there was no war whether the war lasted for one, five, ten, twenty years, God uh, forbid. But I mean, this was our vision, and it didn't really change. And and I mentioned in the book that you know we we went through a lot of analysis then, and we did like I I identified the three main critical success uh, factors that we needed to get right, no matter what. They were of trust, uh, liquidity, and the ability to lend in a competitive way. And and we thought about it like I mean no matter what happened, mm. uh, whether uh, the war you know you know uh, the, uh, again you know last for for one year five years ten years, people with banking needs need to uh, trust a bank and uh, and uh, and actually even uh, more so during a crisis, we did need to have a liquidity, uh, and that was uh, something you know um, again we needed to do uh, no matter wh what. So, so having this laser focus on these uh, three things, regardless of what was happening. Now, now I'm not, I'm not saying that that uh, we were passive, you know, to, uh, to what was happening, you know, around us. No, I mean we were not. We 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 did have, you know, a quarter of our branches actually get destroyed and rampaged. But yeah, but uh, but, uh, and uh, the worst war in modern times could uh, and it did destroy up to a quarter of our branches on. But uh, even the worst war in modern times doesn't necessarily destroy your uh, uh, critical success mm. factors and really having this laser focus you know on it uh, matters most because if you don't then uh, almost uh, anything else you do won't really matter yeah, definitely one of the things i wanted to ask you and if you don't mind it's maybe a bit of a personal question but when i was reading the book it felt to me like it's a lot to manage, not only the bank itself, but also perhaps your family life and also just your own mental health and your own ability to function. How were you able to manage your work and personal life during that time? Because I think a lot of people, perhaps a lot of readers may read this and think, yeah, OK, he was doing the bank, but then he was also managing obviously his family life. But then there was also a war going on. So it's sort of three competing factors that are all in themselves very stressful so what was your approach to to dealing with it on a day-to-day -day basis well i don't think i had a i, uh, I had like a very methodical like you know like a very scientific uh, approach towards it. it was really uh, tough on that so but i can say but uh, again, I think when when you know a crisis is very universal, you know this was uh, something affecting like you know everyone in the uh, country. There was this feeling of maybe like a you know, collective uh, resilience, and uh, and I mean to be fair, like I mean relative to to uh, to the rest of the uh, country, I uh, actually felt uh, quite blessed and uh, comfortable. Yes, I mean there were uh, mortar bombs falling in Damascus, but I mean, the uh, Damascus had it maybe better than the, than the rest of the of the uh, country. So, so, so in that context, uh, on and with that, you know, collective feeling of like, you know, what's what's happening is like, you know, affecting us, uh, that I think m makes it slightly okay. easier, you know, then again, I uh, don't want to, you know, undermine the uh, challenges. There were, uh, there were lots of challenges. And you know, this, uh, this was a life changing experience for me personally but uh, but i think having that universal uh, uh collective uh 
you know, situation we're facing as a crisis helped. And to, yeah, I mean, just just being, you know, I guess, you know, uh, having uh, empathy and just, uh, you know, approaching things both uh, emotionally and uh, rationally. Uh, yes, I mean, life was was uh, tough, but you know, at the end of the of the day, people wanted to to live their their life. So 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 I met my my wife now during the war and uh, actually and yes it was a lot uh, harder to to meet someone and get like married during the war but but life needs to uh, move on i think beautifully in the book as well you talk about not doing things half-heartedly i like that because you gave the yeah, description of yeah, when you're standing yeah. at a cliff you either take the full jump or if you take the half step you end up in the cave so um or down the <laughs> ditch so yeah. i i definitely yeah. like the spirit of not doing things half-heartedly it seems like a a principle yeah. that you live by yes yes i know and i and i uh, i think maybe people now like during the the, the uh, past year you know they saw uh, cases of the like you know governments uh, across the world and you know, organizations and so on where where they uh, want to change but don't really want to change so so they do half-hearted changes and my uh, principle was, you know, it's very, like, you know, simple. If something needs to change, then make sure that you change it with, 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 uh, with all the resources and dedication that it needs. And if it doesn't, then you know, it doesn't. But just taking, like, you know, a string of half-hearted decisions that just, you know, stress you out and don't actually end up uh, the happening. Yeah, it doesn't really. Yeah, yeah, I don't really. Yeah, I believe in that. As you've transitioned and you've obviously moved away and now you live in London and you're reflecting back on your time and I'm sure the book was very much a reflective process as well thinking about the time yeah. what personal yeah. life lessons did you learn and how has your outlook on life in general changed having done that reflective thinking and, and writing the book uh, well uh, I would say you know a few things well, maybe the most uh, important one is, is to to enjoy life and just you know think of things as being you know temporary and and not play the waiting game to just like wait until but things like you know finish so i remember like you know earlier in the pandemic lots of people that i met i mean both personally and professionally as well you know they were waiting for this to to, to uh, to end and I think that because I mean this is a, what I did earlier on like 10 years ago but but I think when you're when you're in that mode that's that's a bit of a passive and doesn't really like you know allow you to 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 pursue opportunities now and to to to, to enjoy your life um, I mean yes difficult times do do happen uh and yes they they uh, might be very challenging more maybe more so for some people less so for for others but you know just you know enjoying your life no matter what uh, happens like you know this was you know a key takeaway for me so yeah and just uh not plan uh, not just uh, waiting for uh, for things you know to to end i mean uh, uh, making sure that you do the best that you can during this uh, time of yeah just making the most of the opportunities that come your way rather than being yeah. passive I, I feel like in the book you talk a lot about yeah. you gave the different models of either staying still or being passive or being active and i think the the theme that i got from that is sometimes staying still is a good thing in the sense that you're not hastening to a decision yeah. but being passive and being still is two different things Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I think like being still is a very deliberate, active uh, decision. So, so you've, you know, thought about the things. You've uh, thought about the alternatives. Then you've decided that you know actually the best course of action is not to do uh, anything. That's that to me is like remaining still. Whereas being uh, passive uh, is not doing you know anything just because you've not really thought of the challenges. So, 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 uh, so yes, I mean, the, the outcome looks the same superficially, mm. but it's not really. One of the things the you talk about in the book as well, and something I wanted to touch upon was everyone always talks about what kills you, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger and how you should actively seek moments of crisis in order to seek opportunities for growth. And you gave a, a description in the book saying, crisis is difficult and it's stressful and it takes a lot out of you. 
and it shouldn't always be seen as an opportunity for growth because for some it can be their destruction so can you talk about the illusion of a crisis and how perhaps the the view of seeing crisis as just an opportunity for growth can be somewhat of a, a dangerous thing yeah so so uh, um, i mean i uh, think it's like you know key to uh, to just uh, 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 clarify one thing here I mean, what I what I say in the book is that, you know, a crisis, uh, I would never say a crisis uh, is an opportunity in the, this case, uh, because I mean, that somehow, you know, makes it seem like I'm someone that, you know, I mean, embraces and, and looks forward to like you know, uh, a crisis. And I can assuredly tell you that I would, that no one that I know ever looked forward to, to you know, a crisis and no one that I know, mm-hmm. you know, enjoyed working in these circumstances. And I do think that, you know, I mean, a crisis can be difficult for for many people and uh, and i think it uh, somehow belittles uh, undermines you know the 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 the, the effects of uh, you know a, a crisis when uh, you know when i say that uh, that you know a crisis uh, is an opportunity in uh, this case but what uh, happens uh, on uh, is that you know sometimes things do happen unfortunately so the war in uh, syria if i had the choice I mean, of course, I would rather that it did not uh, happen, but it did uh, happen, and I had no control, you know, over it. But uh, uh, but uh, but I mean, what? Uh, so so uh, for us, you know, the key was, you know, there is a crisis, uh, and we need to manage it and pursue, you know, I mean, opportunities, in uh, spite of the increasing challenges that we were facing. So so uh, so yes, the key was. You know, ensuring that you're pursuing opportunities no matter what always always pursuing opportunities uh you, you yeah uh, probably right. in line with that is how was that transition then in the book i don't remember reading how you sort of moved from leaving the bank and then moving to london uh, what was that experience like and how how was that transition from from living in syria to now moving in, and living in london yeah yeah so 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 after around four four to five uh, years during the uh, the crisis there uh, we decided my uh, wife and I that uh, that it, that uh, that we wanted to move uh, outside and my uh, wife is a Syrian uh, British and we were like uh, able to to uh, easily move to uh, London which is what uh, probably, we did probably sensible do you, do you miss it though uh, of course I do. I mean, uh, uh, every minute of my, of my life, maybe. Yeah, of course I do. I mean, uh, the, it's home. Uh, on a, and I think, you know, when you're when you're somehow, you know, forced to uh, to leave, because I mean, if it uh, wasn't for the war, I uh, I don't think yeah. that I would have ever left. But but yeah, I mean, you know, things uh, became a lot worse, 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 and it made you know sense for uh, for our family to 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 eventually move out and. Yeah, I mean, of course, it, it yeah, of course. wasn't uh, easy. Like uh, initially in the uh, pandemic, you know, people found it very difficult. You know, the message was uh, stay home, stay home. And the people was uh, people found it difficult to uh, stay home. And it is difficult to like stay home. But uh, what I can say is, you know, a thousand, what's a thousand times harder is to like, you know, and actually it's not leave like home. It's just, it's not close. So, it's uh, completely different easy. culture. But you had visited, you had visited yeah. before, hadn't you? So. Yeah. You, I think you talk about it to London, yeah, because you talk about to your grandfather, I think, in the book, don't you? And say, so. oh yes, yes, yeah, I have been to 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 uh, to London quite a few uh, times. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, before and I moved here. Yeah. What 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 are you doing now then? So you're no longer working at the at the bank, I assume. So you've obviously written the book, and um, what what is a what is a day in the life look like now then? What what have you focused your attention on? <laughs> Okay, so um, yeah, okay, so so I'm still uh, working in finance and uh, planning, but I moved away from banking and now working more for for the international development uh, okay. sector. So, so I work for UNICEF UK. Um, you know, also in a role that's very uh, similar to to my old role in finance and planning, and uh, and uh, and I'm also doing a lot of events for uh, my book. So. So, so I get in, uh, invited to uh, to book talks, to uh, speaking uh, events, and so on. What so, have you learned uh, speaking to individuals and going to events and talking about the book? Because 
from what I've spoken to about authors, it's like they write the book and it's a very singular experience because they're just writing about their own thoughts and ideas and many don't really have the opportunity to speak to others during the writing process. But mm. in the in sharing it with others, then they share their experiences mm. back to them, readers sharing their experiences back to them. So what have you learned mm. from readers yeah, and yeah, yeah. their experiences and reading and them reading it and them talking to you about it from, from the book coming out? Yeah. Yeah, so so uh, actually, so what uh, happened uh, on, uh, is that the book was uh, published uh, April last year, which which like almost perfectly coincided. Uh, I mean, I, I don't want to say perfectly to to make it seem like you know a positive thing, but but uh, but it did yeah. like coincide with the with the uh, pandemic. So so many people yeah. found it you know, like I mean relevant. And like, uh, like, I mean, talking to uh, the people, uh, really, I mean, it was really like, you know, interesting to me because, you know, the book was uh, uh, written before the pandemic. And, you know, people have faced this uh, pandemic, you know, across the whole world, you know, there was this, you know, a crisis that came almost out of nowhere, you know, affecting everyone in a um, somewhat similar way as it did to us. You know, ten years ago in uh, Syria. So, so, so it was really interesting to like you know hear people's you know thoughts of when when uh, when they had read the the book and you know many many of the the, the ideas that I talked about and you know one central uh, the idea that that I talk about you know in the book is not to get fixated on survival because because uh, I mean we saw how you know banks that you know tend to, uh, tended to uh, freeze and to fixate on survival. That action, you know, actually ended up being suicidal because survival uh, is really not dying. You know, I mean, that's it. So, so, so it's not a very aspirational, you know, state to to be in. So, so, so when you're fixated on survival, you're you don't tend to. I mean, and this is what we noticed uh, in the banking uh, sector. That doesn't really allow you to, like, you know, pursue uh, the the opportunities and you know improve your self. Uh, and that's like one thing uh, theme which uh, which I did talk talk a lot about with you know people you know here because I mean that was maybe the uh, inclination of many organizations, many governments, you know, and even you know people uh, on a personal level to you know, to uh, to just be be happy with with survival. But I mean, reading re reading the book, I think it uh, it did maybe trigger uh, people to you know maybe maybe take another step say hold on a second why am i just being a content with like you know surviving in my you know uh, in the industry can't i actually you know improve myself are there like you know opportunities that uh, i can maybe you know i mean uh, embrace because it's very tempting to have this you know dominant feeling of, of a pending doom reigning in and letting that mm -hmm. like you know obstruct you from doing almost anything else and the feeling that I got was that, you know, I mean, my book was, you know, talking about, yes, I mean, I mean, uh, acknowledging the, the great difficulties. I mean, I'm not there to whitewash and, and, you know, I mean, say that, you know, things are very, you know, positive. No, I think things could be very difficult, but still, uh, uh, even then, opportunities could be sought and one could think of, you know, thriving and, you know, improving themselves no matter what. Yeah. I think it's a, yeah, it's a yeah. mindset thing. I think it's a mindset thing because like you said, you had some people professionally and personally that you spoke to during the mm -hmm. pandemic and during that time yeah. that yeah. were just waiting for it to be over. Yeah. And then there were others that were actively seeking and finding ways to improve themselves, whether yeah. it's a new business opportunity, yeah. whether it's a new hobby, whatever yeah. whatever it might be, something to improve yeah. themselves. So yes. Yes. it's more it of a mindset. mindset yes. And uh, mindset uh, is key on because, I mean, the mindset really dictates like, you know, everything. If one's mindset is... You know, I mean, negative and just you know, fix uh, say so on the negatives, uh, then that really would like you know hinder them from, from like you know doing all of these uh, uh, things that you just uh, talked about. Yeah, definitely. Um, one of the things I think is really important to pick up on, and something that I think that I really enjoyed about your book was the importance of talking about yourself honestly, because I feel like in these types of leadership books. I feel like I might be your experience as well. It's probably one of the reasons why you, you decided to write this book was that people very much talk about it from an academic perspective. Mm. But do you feel like there needs to be more books on this topic talking about crisis management from their own personal experience? And do you feel like your book is a 
not a counter to that, but very much saying like these processes and these formulas are good, but it need there needs to be some action behind it and there needs to be some application in the real world. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, I do believe, I mean, of course, in the merits of uh, academia, uh, but uh, I think, like, you know, the, the challenges of this uh, uh, crisis, like, you know, posed to to us were 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 just very novel and you know which is why maybe there were, there was no literature you know on it and and i thought that you know and initially in the book like you know even at the outset in the preface i do say that you know if you're looking for a book where where, where i mean the work was you know based based on rigorous field work from from the libraries and you know schools of, of oxford boston or london this is not for you this is based on real, uh, on the ground, skin in the game experience from the mm. dusty streets of uh, Syria. Yeah, and I do think you do need both. I mean, the last thing I would want to do is bash uh, uh, academia, but I do think that you know, I mean, they're they're like it should be maybe more 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 emphasis on skin in the game, uh, actual practical ex- uh, experience. Yeah. You know, and it's very like you know interesting because. Because when like I did my my MBA in Boston, and you know people love stories and love you know actual uh, practical stories. So so I remember like you know the most fun in uh, engaging uh, uh, classes was when when we discussed actual case studies of like you know actual businesses in the world. Yeah. So so I think there there maybe should be more story like you know more places for that. And one uh, more thing on I uh, do think that. You know, most most of the business uh, uh, academia, you know, I mean, uh, quotes stories from you know the big companies in the world, the Googles, the, the Facebooks, and so on. But I do think uh, that there's you know valuable learning experience from from businesses all over the world, mm-hmm. whether it's a Sri Lankan crab company, whether uh, whether it's a rice farm in China, whether it's a bank in uh, Syria, and, and I do think that. You know, stories from these parts of, of uh, the world that would be very interesting, like, you know, as well, because mm. I, I, I do think there's, you know, this uh, commercial business uh, acumen that's just that's not uh, only, you know, uh, present in like, you know, the big uh, Googles and uh, Facebooks and so on. Yeah, they're like universal principles of, of business and, yeah, and yeah. Whatever, whatever it might be. I want to quickly touch upon something. A lot of the listeners are young. They're sort of between the ages of 18 to mm-hmm. to 24. And a lot of them are budding writers. So a lot of them are looking to write, whether it's, you know, full time or in their in their spare time, they, they write a lot. So can you talk about your writing process? And this was, I'm assuming, your first book. So what was your yeah. process for writing and some of the difficulties and, and challenges that you found and how and how you overcame them? Sure. So um, initially, so, so I've always wanted to write a book uh, on it was uh, uh, like, you know, an idea that I was uh, toying around like, you know, uh, ever since I was 10. But I had no idea that I would end up writing a business you know, a part business book, uh, because uh, actually on, I don't really, you know, enjoy reading lots of uh, business books. Do you do you prefer but, to uh, read fiction? I'm, I'm actually, uh, no, I uh, read a lot of non-fiction, oh, okay. so more history, geography, religion, okay. and so okay, on, nice. yeah. But, uh, so, so, so when I moved to uh, uh, the UK, initially I did want to write a book, and, and I, and I uh, did write a novel. And I did spend, you know, a few months like you know, on it. Then I ended up throwing it in the rubbish. I really hated it. <laughs> uh, and I was like, no, I mean, there's no way, like, you know, I want to pursue this. I, I don't know why. I mean, uh, it was uh, just a feeling uh, that I had. But then when I was meeting people here in, like, you know, London and, you know, sharing my stories, you know, uh, about how, how it was, you know, at the bank and so on. Uh, um, uh, yeah, and I did feel like, you know, people were really far with these uh, stories then then uh, i was like wait i mean maybe maybe i do, do uh, maybe i do have a story to tell you know and it's not that you know uh, the stupid uh, novel which uh, which i threw in, uh, i really want to know what that story was so, about so, i really want to know <laughs> <laughs> i know you're probably not gonna say but... uh, you don't uh, actually <laughs> so so i ended up uh writing 
you know, I, just like, you know, a memoir and so on. And, and then, and then I did find that, you know, I mean, and I did have a, like, you know, a story within me that, uh, that was worth uh, sharing. So, so I did uh, end up writing it and I did, you know, approach, uh, you know, again, I was not like, you know, I, I wasn't uh, anywhere in the, like, you know, the writing you know, in the uh, industry or like, you know, uh, society, but, uh, but I do think, you know, if you do have a story, you know, I mean, if I had like, you know, I mean, a message to like, you know, everyone, you know, I was, you know, someone that moved to to the UK, zero connections uh, to uh, the writing in uh, the street societies and so on. But, but I think, you know, people, you know, when I did the approach you know, uh, agents and I got deals from uh, the biggest publishing houses in the world and ended up uh, publishing it with the uh, Penguin, yeah. I think what uh, helped is like, you know, really... I mean, pursuing uh, opportunities, like, you know, again, just, you know, believing in yourself and just, you know, going uh, out there and uh, no, not to be demotivated by by the naysayers and, you know, the voices that will tell you, I mean, who who the heck are you to, like, you know, publish a book, like, you know, English, like, isn't even your first uh, language and, you I mean, people go to school, people, you know, take a, a, a creative writing classes, uh, people do all sorts of uh, things, you know, uh, over so many years to get published. I, I mean, there will you know, always uh, be those naysayers, but, mm -hmm. but I think if you're really focused on what you're doing and, uh, you know, really sure sure of your genuine voice and story and just, you know, giving it the best that uh, you could. And it, uh, and it did, you know, uh, eventually work out uh, for me. I think that the powerful thing about this book in particular and some of my favorite books in this space is the fact that they are their own personal stories. Like you were saying that you wrote this novel and you threw it away. But partly perhaps the reason is, is that there wasn't that deep connection. But this is obviously your life. Yeah. So there's a deep personal yes, yes, connection yeah. that you have yeah. to this book. And anything that has that deep personal connection yeah. will always be better. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you answered that uh, a thousand times uh, better than uh, the way I answered it. So, so yeah, I'll take your. Uh, so, what what are what are some of the books that you said that you don't enjoy reading a lot? If I had that right, but you said that you like reading nonfiction books, whether they be history, geography, or whatever they might be, perhaps business books or religion mm -hmm. books as yeah. well. So w what are some of the books that you have read recently that you think are, are great and you'd like to share with listeners? Because obviously we're a book podcast, so people love to read and, and find new books. So yeah, sure. what are some of the ones that you've read recently that have had, a, had an impact on you? So, so I think uh, uh, it's a mix of uh, books that I read so uh, uh recently i've been uh, reading a lot by uh, nasim nicholas yeah. talib uh, and yeah. fragile skin in the game yeah and uh, so mm -hmm. so i do enjoy a lot of his uh, readings and i do enjoy like you know some of his you know approach and and i've been reading some some history geography uh, books uh, the, 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 as well uh, there's a book called uh, fallen you know it uh, talks about 10, uh, 10 or 12 buildings, you know, in the world. And the, the, the history of these uh, buildings and the, you know, implications that they they continue to have to this day. So, so such as, I mean, such as, you know, uh, the, like, I mean, Palmyra, like, you know, some ruins mm. in uh, Palmyra, Syria, some ruins in Iraq, um, you know some uh, uh, um, uh, building in uh, Jerusalem, mm -hmm. you know, in Spain, and they like, and it's like, it's a very fascinating way of like talking about uh, history because it's uh, centered on like one uh, monument. Then, then I mean, the uh, author brilliantly talks about all the implications of this, you know, mm -hmm. monument, uh, how when it was built, and the consequences that this uh, monument mm -hmm. continues to have up until this day. So this was really interesting book uh, for me i mean history told that in a mm. very novel way you know baseline you know against that particular monument so so uh, no. yeah that was one yeah that was a very uh, a very interesting read that yeah I that sounds really read. interesting as someone who has traveled to yeah. the middle east and to iraq many times as well you for 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 religious yeah. reasons you know the significance of certain places based on their or based on the monuments because yeah. people go yeah. there every yeah. single year like for us 
you, we visit no, yes. I mean, obviously not now but when we visit like Karbala for stuff like that it's like 10 million people go every single year mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. like well what yeah. significance yeah. does a building have if 10 million people <laughs> go see it every cool. single year and go visit it so exactly yeah, it's, it's yeah. amazing yeah, yeah yeah and they've been doing it for yeah, like hundreds thousands. of years so yes. yeah it's, yes. it's 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 amazing so thank yeah. you for that recommendation and thank you for taking the time to speak with us um to discuss your book lessons lessons from oh, war zone you, you know i i, f I feel like as someone who enjoys personal stories but also wants practical advice on on business but also you know life in general i felt like it was a it was a great book and and one that everyone can learn something from um where's the best place that people can find you um to to connect with you um so, uh, so I have a website they can contact me on my website and I'm, uh, and I'm also on social uh, media. Not a big uh, user of uh, uh, Twitter, but but uh, but they can uh, reach me on. But excellent, I'll I'll put I'll put your links in the yeah. description below anyway. So if anyone wants to reach out to you, contact you, well, thank and you. obviously get the book and obviously get sure. the book as well. So, yeah, like awesome. I said, thank you for taking the time to speak with awesome. with us today. Thank, uh, thank you, On. I was uh, delighted and honored to be here on your show. Thanks a lot. Good day. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more content. Also, visit our website, www.booktalktoday.com, to subscribe and download the latest edition of our magazine. Join our mailing list to receive the first issue for free to get a taste for the value packed content that we are offering. Book Talk Today for readers by readers.